this time I'm asking that we go to the Lord in prayer before I get this opportunity to speak what the Lord had on my heart. Father, we are grateful for this facility and for this ministry, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for, for through the years just being able to minister to the community, Father God. And we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we have today, right now. Right now, we've been already praising and worshiping you, Father God, and we're going to continue, Father God, to do that as we've done it in song, we've done it in giving, we're going to do it through your word. We thank you, Father God, for this opportunity, Father God, and I pray, Lord, that the people will see you. They won't see me, they'll see you. They'll see you resurrected from the cross. They'll see the marks in your hands and in your feet. They'll see the resurrected Jesus Christ as they hear these words to get a deeper understanding. Father, we're asking for more faith today. We're asking for more wisdom today. Father, we're asking for renewed minds, Father God. Father, we're asking for circumcised hearts, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you've given a malleable heart now. It wasn't always that way, but now it is, and we thank you for that, Father God. We thank you, Lord. We come to you, Father God, with these and other requests, Father God, that haven't been spoken in the mighty and matchless name of your Son, Yeshua Yamashiach, Jesus the Messiah. We praise his name, the name above all names, and we come to you in his name. Amen. <coughs> Good morning. <coughs> Sorry, I got a little tickle here. So today, <coughs> I get the opportunity, and I'm blessed. And I believe this will be a very meaningful sermon. I titled it Friendly. But as I was praising and worshiping and just listening to the Lord. It's almost as if this should have been titled intimacy. Fellowship. Something like that. That type of, you know, Jesus, there's a time, it came to me as I was on my knees, Jesus said, you can now call me friend. There's a thing going on where you call me friend. That's the way he says to come to him and praise him. And I realize many of us too often get sidetracked when it comes to understanding how to get more intimate, how to get deeper in fellowship with the Lord. And if we will, if we'll pause and allow His Word to be planted firmly in our hearts and let our minds process this, God has revealed the blueprint for having this fellowship, this friendship, this intimacy with Him. It goes all the way back to the garden. Of Eden. But I, I want to pick it up where we go a few millennia forward from that in Exodus chapter 25 when, when the Lord is speaking to Moses and he says this to Moses in Exodus 25 verse 8. He says, and God's speaking to Moses and he says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this down some because it, it may be appear rather simple. You know, make, make me a building. Make me a sanctuary, he says. But I think we tend to forget that this tabernacle or this temple is where God dwells. And now, in this existence, where we are now, he says the tabernacle or the temple resides within each person. Okay? We each, if we have believed in His Son, if we have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are the temple of God. He resides there. And, and how worship, if we, we grasp this, okay? The priesthood, we look at all these things from all these millennia ago where he, God was giving instructions right there recorded in Exodus 25. These sacrifices, these offerings that were brought, they, they literally will give each of us, it's like a benchmark, if you will, of how our own personal relationship is coming along with the Lord. 
<clears throat> now, in the New Testament, there's a book called the book of Hebrews. We're not clear who the author was. Uh, scholars claim, a lot of scholars think it was Paul, but we're not sure. But he, this, this author was writing a letter to the Hebrews, and I would imagine that this author was a Hebrew himself. And so, in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, and I read from the Aramaic version of the Bible, the Scriptures tell us here that now, above all, we have a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. And, ha and he has become the minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which God pitched, which means it's meaning God made it, not man. Then further on in Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 1, in the Aramaic version of the Bible I read, for the law had in it a shadow of the good things to come, but was not the essence of the things themselves. Hence, although the same sacrifices were offered every year, they could not perfect those who offered them. Now I believe what there's, there's so many tie-ins of the Scriptures from, the, from you know, what we call the Old Testament to the New Testament that we, they're put together in what we call the Bible, these 66 different books written by you know, almost 40 different authors. I believe that there's a direct correlation to what we just heard and to what Jesus was saying on, as he was beginning the Sermon on the Mount recorded in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. At the beginning of the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Well, let me just say something about that. And I may, you, you know, it may appear that I'm bouncing around, but I'm trying to give us understanding of this thread. When, when God is speaking to Moses in the Old Testament there on Mount Sinai, and he gives him the law, he puts them on tablets, on these stones, and it was, it was outside of the people. It, you, you saw it. It was outside. Okay? And, and they were written. And these were guidelines. And, and, and now, what goes on now after the Lord revealed himself in flesh, Jesus Christ, and when he just said that, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. If you believe in him, what you now have are the, to are the Ten Commandments, are those stony tablets living inside of you. They're no longer on the outside, and they're not inside you because they save you. They have nothing to do with salvation. Believing in Jesus is what re how you receive salvation. But because He has fulfilled the law, the law resides within you if you believe in Jesus. I hope that's making sense. Okay? So, God, he calls his children to the tabernacle, like back, okay, so bouncing back to the tabernacle, to Moses, he's, he's saying, you guys build this tabernacle, and he's calling the people to the tabernacle, to what? They're to come to approach him, right? To be near the Lord, to worship the Lord, to bring sacrifices and offering to the Lord. And I believe there's a great... Uh, Understanding to gain for us from looking at the examples of how the Lord was worshipped at the tabernacle. And that will assist us in, in many times with our maybe confusion or struggle with how you are, are to be intimate with the Lord. How you to be, how can I call God a friend when I don't even, I can't touch him. I, I, I you know, I, could, I, I read the word and I know he is the word I'm told and so, but I'm still struggling because I have these eyes and and I have these ears, and I don't tend to see him, or I don't tend to hear from him the way I maybe think I should, right? And I think this will assist us greatly in this fellowship, in this being a friend, and having intimacy with the Lord. Now, the Hebrew word for worship is shakal, and it's, it's a verb. And if you know anything about verbs, they're actions. You have to, it's not a verb unless it's doing something. There, there has to be a corresponding action with shaka, with worship. Now, some of the ways that we do uh, shaka is we will bow, we will kneel, we will prostrate. Laying flat like this is worshiping. That's called prostrating yourself in front of something. In this case... It was ways that God, it's not all the ways, but it, those were ways that God said to worship him. 
That's an action. And it's that our hearts assume a uh, position of humbly beseeching or a reverence toward the person or the thing we are worshiping. And worship is supposed to be about a, a, a reflection that we do that makes, here we go, that makes God the center rather than ourselves the center. And how we've been born, we've been born into this. Okay, so we have, to, we have to battle this, but we have been born into a Christian culture in which we have been kind of, it's had a huge impact on it, and it should. But if it's done wrong, it has that equally bad impact. And, and the Christian culture that we've grown up to on how to approach God, unfortunately, has been a very, very, very selfish and very self-centered, focused on the self, worship. Basically, the Western world, the Western Christian world, has unfortunately taught many Christians to be a consumer. And it's unfortunately how many Christians today approach a relationship with, with God. Many times within the, the Christianity and by assimilation, the church. You know, when you, you, we go to church and the church, man has been made the center rather than God. But as we study the tabernacle and research the way the Hebrews were taught by God to approach him, we should see some differences compared to some of the things taught on how to approach the Lord in our culture. So let's humble ourselves and renew our minds to this. And now let me, let me just step away and go right to the Garden of Eden. Go even back further on what I was just talking about to make, is man the center or God? There are these two brothers, Cain and Abel. Now mom and dad, and they all, had just been kicked. Let me give you a history lesson here. They've been kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Just so you understand, Garden of Eden is heaven on earth. That's the model. That's what we're all trying to, that's what we're pushing towards to replicate. They were kicked out because of sin. Remember who was at the east gate was two, these cherubim with flaming swords that are watching the door, watching the entryway, and they're not able to come back in. Now they're in Eden. They're just not in the garden anymore that was in Eden. All right? Now, Cain and Abel, their first two boys, are, to bring, are bringing an offering to the Lord. Cain, the older, brings uh, some grain. He's, he's a farmer, and he's bringing grain. Now, when we look at the offerings that Cain brings and Abel, Abel brings, he's a, he's a, a shepherd, he brings a sheep, a lamb. And when we look in Leviticus... Down the road, both of those kinds of offerings are what you're supposed to bring to the Lord. They're different offerings. They, they, you know, so we don't know a lot of why, the, why was God telling Cain, your offering isn't as good as Abel's. Here's what we know. Abel's offering was the first lamb, was the first. And, it, and, and that was priority as there was another thing if you know and there's not a lot of things about this that that the bible talks about it says that it was the first and that the fatty parts the fatty parts were the things that apparently god enjoys the most delicate part he tells cain your offer offerings is not as good as his it's okay you can work on it and then he, war- he warns Cain, but be careful because sin is waiting for you at the door. There's a mention of this door. And then throughout the scriptures, throughout the Hebrews, it's not, a, it's not a metaphorical door of your heart. It's a real door. And, I, and remember, we have these two cherubim that are guarding the door. Okay? Now, That's not the only time we hear about this. God's giving instructions now to Moses about a tabernacle. There was a door, a one-way entryway into the tabernacle. Only one way. And do you know the first thing you do once you went through that door is the offering, where you put the offering and the altar of the offering. That's the first thing you do. So I'm trying to get us to grasp 
that these aren't separate little things going on. This is a thread that God is constantly showing the people about how to praise and worship him, how to honor him, how we are to bring our offerings. And one of the things that apparently is very impressive to God is if we give him the first of stuff and we give it all. So I just want us to grasp this. And this is about today. Remember, it's about being intimate with God. So there's something here that I think a lot of us, it's like a switch. It goes off. But this is the key to having the proper worship the way God describes it, not the way man describes it. The way God describes it. And I think if we can grasp this, you know, from like, I'm, I'm kind of giving a, a, a macro level, a, a very large level of how you approach worship, as well as Drilling into the micro, the, just the individual, each one of us, the way we worship the Lord and approach the Lord. And with respect to the tabernacle, the Hebrews approached the Lord very reverently. And as we mentioned earlier, one of the meanings of the word of worship is to prostrate ourselves, to put our face on the ground. That's a humble thing to do. You can't see what anybody's going to do then. And right then, we need to understand that the first thing the Hebrews did was prostrate themselves, which means they didn't come to the tabernacle. Here, you got to get this. They did not come to church to receive something or to be blessed, but to worship Yahweh. How much different is that than when, what goes on today in most worship services? See, first, first, we are to worship God. Think about that, folks. When you go to church... And, and ask yourself these types of questions. Do you attend? Do you come so you will receive? Do you find yourself saying this? I need to be fed at church today. Are you hoping it will be a good sermon? Hoping it will be stimulating for you? Do you come to church with that type of attitude? And I say that because most of us would never intentionally disrespect Jesus. And I'm not saying you can't come here because guess what? I'm here because I need something. I need the grace and the mercy and the peace of God. Okay, so I'll admit it. So I'm not, I'm just telling you, but this is where we've got to deal with ourselves, right? We need that from the Lord <laughs> and from the Lord's representative, the local church. So we need grace, we need mercy, we need peace. But quite plainly, folks, anything that is a reduced result of what Jesus said in John 10.10 10, is disrespectful to the reason Jesus died for you and I. He says, I came that they may have. That's us. He said, I came that we can have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Every day, every day that we're here, we come face to face with the purpose, priority, and passion of Jesus Christ and the sacrifices that he's already made for you and I. And it becomes a reminder of the opportunity that we're presented with. Either a life that is average, dull, routine, or one that's engaging, maximized, and fulfilling in the day. In the day. Because you're not promised tomorrow. And if you're planning to do live greater tomorrow, you might not have a tomorrow. And you're going to regret that. Because God didn't die so you could blow it off today and then get ready for tomorrow. He said, no, give it all today and don't be concerned about tomorrow. It's like we slap Jesus in the face when we live beneath the possibilities and potential that Christ has made available for us. When we settle for a listless and lackluster life of going through the motions and pursuing you know, inconsequential plans, we essentially cause what he did on the cross to have no effect in our lives. There are a lot of us that are stuck between living a life that's okay and a life that is maximized and fulfilling. If surveyed, like if we did a survey right now, if God just did, a, did his x-ray scan and posted it up on the screen right now for everybody to see without your name, I would guarantee, I, 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 I don't have a problem saying this at all, that there's hardly going to be any of us that are living our life to the fullest like we should be. I think a lot of us just exist with no satisfaction. They settle for whatever is thrown at them. They literally live under the circumstances rather than taking full advantage of both the good and the bad opportunities that are presented to us. In other words, 
Many don't take the lemons and make lemonade. They insist on sucking on the lemons that are bitter. And be careful. Be careful right now because some of you are going to jump to the conclusion that I'm referring to a group of unbelievers, a group of backsliders, or hard-hearted religious people. What I'm saying also applies to folks that by all appearances are good Christian people. They've submitted to Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're regular church attenders. They're active in ministry programs. They're, they're faithful stewards of their time, talent, treasure, and testimony. And a great way, I think, a very simple way of what I'm trying to say is imagine that you're very thirsty. You're just like parched. And you haven't had a drink for at all today. Okay? And all of a sudden, right here, a bubbling brook comes up that's pure spring water. And you'd come up to it, and you'd only take a sip. That just wouldn't make much sense. Christ declared that he wants to be that fountain in our lives. In other words, it's, a, it's very sad to repeatedly see good Christian people that are bored or going through the motions and not as excited as they were on Resurrection Day, for instance. I mean, Christ is still risen, is he not? Yes. Hallelujah! Yes. Christ rose not so that we would live a life of mediocrity and casualness, but a life of fire, effectiveness, and vibrancy. He's risen to serve as an example of what new life can be with wounds in him. I know all of us have wounds, do we not? Well, we've got to get over our pity party, folks, and live. He offers that new life where it brings new experiences, new mercies, new victories. Listen, let's not continue to slap Christ in the face by settling for anything less. That attitude we should have first and foremost is to worship God, to bless God with an attitude of heartfelt thankfulness so we can live life to the fullest. And when we do that, listen, that's first about Him not about you. Let's replace making us the center with making him the center. Folks, true worship and the pattern for true worship and the, the principles of true worship are revealed in the tabernacle and they have the priests and the sacrifices that are given displayed without a shadow of a doubt that it's not us at the center, but it's Yahweh at the center. The first priest did not come grumbling into the church service when they brought the offerings and the sacrifices. No, they came humbly to present Yahweh a sacrifice. And the word sacrifice in the Hebrew is korban. And it means to come close, to draw near, to offer a sacrifice. It's kind of like being intimate, being friendly, having fellowship. So when the Lord was showing the Hebrews the way to get intimate, to be a friend, to get close to him, it was to bring him a sacrifice. Bring him an offering. And this idea of a sacrifice was not just that they were giving something up, but rather that they were giving the sacrifice so they could come near to him. Now let, let's just pause there. Let's be honest. Let's be honest about this. I would say that some of us, I don't know how many, but some of us, when we think about making a sacrifice, when we think about making an offering to the Lord, we process that as we're giving something up without recognizing that the very principle about offering and sacrifice is that it brings us near to God. We don't process it like it's coming near to God. I mean, do we process that when we just, Freddie was just up here, Elder Freddie was just up here, you know, bringing me to tears about talking about what this guy Stephen was willing to do by sharing the entire history of the Jewish people about how Jesus is the Messiah, and they killed him for telling them the truth. And, and Freddie's sharing about how that is to bring an offering. And I, are we, when we do that, are we thinking about the Lord in a way that we're giving something up? Or are we doing it because we're honoring him? I really I think, I think some of us need to acknowledge the mistake we need to repent of that and renew our mind and again gain an understanding of why it is critical to offer with a very clean heart. Offer with a, with a joyful heart because if you're grumpy or you're sad, 
right? Or you're disappointed about offering. Or like, oh my gosh, I got to give this up. I don't think God wants to fellowship with that kind of attitude. How about the example in the scriptures of, of Jesus talking about this woman who washed him with a costly bottle of perfume, right? And then she used her hair to wash his feet. It's recorded in the Gospels in Matthew 26, for instance, starting in verse 6. Let's, let's read this. I read from the NIV. <clears throat> Excuse me. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? They asked. This per perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus says to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Bingo, I just did it. Just told her, again, in memory of her. This act of worship, Jesus said, would be remembered and read about for the ages to come. She wasn't coming to receive something from the Lord. She was coming to worship and give something to him and make Jesus the center of her worship. It's a wonderful example of worship, and we need to embrace that style of worship. Uh, that style of worship is humble. That style of worship is not proud. That type of worship doesn't care one little bit about what anybody's going to say about how I'm worshiping. That type of worship, unfortunately, would likely be ridiculed and made fun of in our culture today in many a church setting. Now, I want to return to what the priests did in their worship of Yahweh when they approached the tabernacle. All the instructions for worship were given directly by the Lord himself to Moses. And these instructions, again, are the blueprints for having intimacy with the Lord, having friendship with the Lord. For instance, there was a fence around the tabernacle and there was only one way. I kind of mentioned this already. There's only one way to enter in there, right? And not only does that show us that there's only one way to enter into it, the tabernacle, which was a physical structure, but it also refers to the proper way to worship God. The way you enter in to the fellowship with the Lord is one way through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the doorway, all right? And see, we've got to understand that we worship God His way and not our way. This will help. This will cleanse our minds and hearts by studying this style that the Hebrews were taught through this principle of sacrifice. This will help us to cleanse us, to deliver us from the culture of Christianity, which basically makes religion, makes our faith in God all about us rather than it being about faith that is rooted in worship of God. True spirituality begins with recognizing who God is and then relating to Him properly. Not as a God that exists just to suit our own needs and pamper us and give us everything we want, but a God that deserves to be reverenced just because of how beautiful, how awesome, and how good He is all the time. Right? Scripture tells us in Proverbs, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Did you hear? I mean, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You know how many really knowledgeable people have no fear of God? They actually don't believe in God. So they're a fool. They despise wisdom and instruction from the Lord. This is not talking to when it says fear of God. It's not talking about a fear of the Lord one would feel under condemnation or judgment, right? And unfortunately, that's taught too much. But the pure and clear reverence of the Lord, which David tells us, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. See, there's a correlation of proper worship outlined for us in the tabernacle in the sacrificial system. This understanding will help us and lead us to true faith and help us walk in the true path of life. Jesus says it this way. Matthew chapter 7. Again, he's Sermon on the Mount. Last part of it. And I read from chapter 7 of Matthew, verses 13 and 14. I have the Aramaic version of the Bible. 
Jesus says, enter in through the narrow door. There's that door again. Okay? And it's narrow. For wide is the door and broad is the road which leads to destruction. So there's multiple doors. One's very narrow. One's pretty, pretty big. And the one that's big leads to destruction. And there's a lot, he says, many who travel on that road. Oh, how narrow is the door and how difficult is the road which leads to life. And few are those who are found on it. Few are found on that road. If you're not finding yourself on that road, guess what? You're still here. Repent of it and get on the narrow road. I mean, he is so good, so gracious, so patient. He's way more patient than I am. Probably way more patient than you are. Right? So let's look at a reference of how Jesus referred to Corbin. I mentioned that Corbin, right? An offering, sacrifice. Mark chapter 7, starting with verse 10. Again, from the Aramaic version. Jesus is speaking. He says, For Moses said, Honor your father, father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, A man may say to his father or his mother, What is left over is Corbin, my offering. And yet you do not let him do anything for his father or mother. So you dishonor the word of God for the sake of a tradition which you have established. And you do a great many other things just like this. The, there was this group of people there, I guess, who were telling Jesus they could not give their Corbin, their offering. They couldn't give it. Their sacrifice to the Lord. They couldn't do it because their claim and their reasoning was that it already had been pledged to somebody else. Well, Jesus sees right through this religious reasoning, and so he says by telling them, this is a rationalization by you to keep this offering for yourself by saying it was already pledged to somebody else. And this still goes on every day in the world. I, I, know, I know some right now are swallowing hard, wondering, is somebody watching me? Am I going to be put up on the screen? Again, like I said, God gives us. You're here. Repent. Stop it. Just admit it. Stop it. Truth is, regardless of anyone here can, can pierce into your heart, our loving Father already knows. You know, there was a popular song that came out a few years ago. I don't know who sings it, but they have a, a verse in there. It goes, He knows, He knows every hurt and every sting. Well, He also knows every lie and deceptive thing. Just so we're aware, right? Again, this word Corbin actually means to come close to, to draw near. It does not mean to give up. That's what so many people think. They think when they bring it up, well, I'm giving up something. I'm giving up something. Again, it's not yours in the first place. It's God's. We're a steward. We're not the owner. So in God calling us to offer up these sacrifices to him, it's not that he's wanting to take something from you and I or that he's wanting us to do something because God's on a big ego trip. It's God's way. He told us this is the way of giving his creation the opportunity to be intimate with him. That's how we're to process. You know, you know, when you give something up for somebody, it brings us close to them. Just, just think about your personal relationships. Let's just, let's, not, let's just get in the natural. Let's get real basic here. The one in a relationship that gives more feels closer to that person. Parents and their kids. Come on. Right? Generally speaking, you know, all of a sudden when kids get to this age about oh, 12, 13, right? The parents feel closer to the teenage children than the teenagers feel towards their parents. Can I get an amen? amen? I know I'm stating the obvious, but I need to get this lesson understood. Because many of us are the teenagers in the relationship with God. Now, there you go. That hit, didn't it? I'm hearing a lot of wows. Finally, somebody's sitting, it's getting in. But that's the truth. We're the know-it-alls. I know that's what you said, Dad. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make light of this because maybe that will resonate in us when we do this and go I'm, and catch ourselves to go, I got to stop it because dad wants to have intimacy with me and I'm the one bucking the intimacy. 
not him. And why is that with our kids? Because we as parents have given all the stuff. We've given a lot of this stuff to them. We've sown a lot more of ourselves, right, into the lives of the kids. The same principle applies to God. And so the Lord is teaching us about intimacy. He calls on us to present a sacrifice. Not a sacrifice as well, folks, that's cheap. Not a sacrifice that's a leftover that we won't even use. Not a sacrifice that costs us nothing, but a sacrifice that actually has meaning to us, actually has value, and costs us something. And what that will do, because we give that up for the Lord, because we give that over to the Lord, we release it. That brings intimacy, brings fellowship, brings friendship. Many, after hearing this with a renewed mind, can grasp now a deeper understanding of what I started with, that God giving instructions to Moses in Exodus 25, 8, right? He says, have them make me a sanctuary, and I will dwell among them. Well, he's here. He's here. Sure, he's here corporately in this big facility, this room, but he's also individually inside you. Okay? And he does this. He's ingenious. Okay? He wants to bring us close. That's how much. He does all of this so that we will get close to him. That's the purpose for the sacrifices. That's the purposes for this offering. And, and I just want to touch a little bit about the, the burnt offering that I kind of mentioned. Okay? That's in the book of Leviticus. The Hebrew word for burnt offerings is ola. Ola. And it means to ascend, to go up, like smoke, to just ascend up in smoke. Now, the distinguishing characteristic of this particular offering or sacrifice is that the entire sacrifice was to be burned up on the altar with all the smoke ascending to Yahweh. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 9 says, Its entrails, however, and its legs he shall wash with water. Taking, talking about the worshiper would wash the entrails. Now, I don't know if you know this, but the entrails are the intestines. Okay? Stomach parts, all those gooey parts. Okay? Inside of all of us. Right? Inside these animals. And the priest shall offer up in smoke all of it on the altar for a burnt offering, an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. There's that word fire. You know, in the worship room, we have these great dialogues about, you know, uh, one of, each one of them takes turns on something that's ministering to him this week and the songs maybe or something going on. And today it was mentioned uh, about fire. And I want that fire inside me. They were saying, we want the fire rekindled. I want my fire reignited. I want my torch reignited. It's the Holy Spirit living inside of us. But here's the deal to understand about fire. It burns off impurities. It burns off all the things. So when you request that, that's good. But here's the deal. Get ready for some pain. And it's because God loves you so much, he's getting rid of all the nonsense you've got that's festering inside of you. But I'm glad people want that because that's the only way to get this ascension for it to go up. If you don't want the fire, well, oh my gosh. But see here, just like what Elijah did when he was feed the, the, the prophets of Baal, he said, douse it with fire because my God's going to lick it up anyway and burn it up anyway. Well, they wash this stuff and then they still burn it. Mm. This is entire consecration we're talking about today. Entire devotion. All of it went up in smoke. Inside and outside. An example of this, another example is you go back, back to Abram. Abraham. He was to bring a burnt offering, wasn't he? Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. God says to him, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Abraham had put all his affections toward his son from all those years. He had no kids. And then he has Ishmael through Hagar. That wasn't it. 
The promise by faith was through his barren wife. They had no kids. He's 100 years old, and he has Isaac. And he offers him up. Abraham believes in faith. He basically goes, well, God, if you're going to do this, that means some other way you're going to do something because you told me I'm going to be the father of many nations. So if you're going to take my son, my one and only son, I ain't going to be able to fulfill that. So I, gotta, I just got to buck, buckle at my knees and follow through on what you say because you said it and I have to obey. Amen. And he did it. He did it. He gave up his son in complete devotion, complete consecration, total commitment, absolute surrender. Well, that's the pattern. Nothing else will suffice for God. We have an example of the wrong way to do this as well. It's in the New Testament. It's Acts chapter 5, the chapter right before Elder Freddie was talking today. A couple of people, a husband and wife team named Ananias and Sapphira. They acted like they were giving up everything, but they didn't. And it was unacceptable to the Lord. And they were struck dead for it. I think another correlation is in the book of Revelation. Jesus is giving this revelation to the angel who's telling the apostle John. Jesus said, I will spit out those that are lukewarm. I want you on fire, he said. I want you hot. I don't want you wishy-washy. I don't want you lukewarm. And Jesus says, unless you are willing to lose your life for my sake, you're not going to be able to find life in eternity. He says, unless you pick up your cross daily, denying yourself daily. No wonder we got to hang out together, folks. Right? He says, it's, it's total abandonment, total surrender, total devotion, total commitment. It's giving up all our rights to God and let God take the wheel and let him do with us and lead us where he wants to lead us. This burnt offering is a prophetic shadow of what God wants from each one of us. So, bringing this to the surface today. And I'm doing it because I believe God wanted me to do this. And I think we're supposed to ask ourselves, reflect, on what kind of lifestyle do I have? Am I totally surrendered to the Lord? Or are there parts of my life that aren't surrendered to the Lord? Now, are you rationalizing with God? Saying, I got you here, but this part of my life is off limits for you. When we worship God, is that the style of worship we do? Too many of us have our lives compartmentalized, right? Like when we come to church services, we, there's like we're a Jekyll and Hyde. It's one personality here, and then when you leave the door, it's another one. I mean, when you run into people, in church services, some of them are the most spiritual people, can quote the Bible, right? Appear to be awesome worshipers, awesome praisers. <clears throat> but as soon as they leave the services and get in the car, everything changes. It's the truth. You've got to deal with that. I think you can relate to what I'm saying. I mean, we have one personality in this environment, and then we have a totally another personality in this environment. In here, you worship God, and then at work, you worship the gossip or the jokes or whatever. Folks, it's just simply displaying a lack of Christian character on our part. That's all it's saying. It's revealing you're failing the test out there. You're claiming you're a Christian, but you buckle under the pressure because you want to be accepted. You got to own this. You got to repent of this. Do not make an excuse for it. Do not push this under the rug, what's coming up to the surface right now. God is saying, this is not the life I've called you to. This is not why I purchased you with my blood. I have so much more for you, God says, but, but you must give your whole life over to me and sacrifice your soul to me. Look at this today and, and apply it to your life. The, the, the burnt offering, it was, it was all burnt up. The inside and the outside. If you can get that understanding, it's going to go a long way in assisting you in what God is looking for you. It's just not from an outward form. It's talking about the inward parts. The secrets that are going on right now in your heart have got to be given over to God. 
When you think of a wrong thought, when you have a wrong feeling, right, you need to have a place inside, a center place. Turn it over to the Lord and admit that this thought, this feeling, is not right. Ask God to cleanse that. Ask God to cleanse all of that for you. I'm going to ask the band to return to the stage. So today, what part of your life do you need to give over to God as a burnt offering? Is, is, it, is it your anger that you seem to not be able to control? Is it your eating habits? Is it your sexual habits? Is it your spending habits, your financial habits that need to be turned over to God? Give this over to God today as a burnt offering. And the Bible tells us that as it's received by Yahweh, it's a sweet, soothing aroma to him. That means in the Hebrew that it's pleasant to the Lord. It's restful. It's a delightful smelling aroma to God. Now, I'll guarantee you, each one of us, when we came through the door today, we wanted to come in here to please God. Correct? Well, God will always receive us when we come to him and announce that God is the Lord of our lives in all aspects of my life. Because, folks, God deserves nothing less. Nothing less. Nothing less. I think it would be a great opportunity for us as the band closes out for us to just humble ourselves. Just humble ourselves. Take a chance to just, you can bring the lights down. Take a chance to just, you know, maybe you've never done this. Come to the altar. Just come to the altar. Don't be concerned about what anybody says. Just come to the altar. Kneel. And maybe if you've got a physical disability and you can't, don't, please, I get that. But, but you know, I just think sometimes if we take the proper it's an action verb, if we will kneel, prostrate ourselves, bow, humble ourselves, Folks, God is aware. We're not fooling Him. Don't let the whatever things going on in your head about, you know, I don't want anybody to see me. Just get rid of that nonsense. God's here. He's, he's residing here. He wants to have a more intimate relationship with every single one of us. Every one of us, regardless of what you've been told about yourself. Get rid of that nonsense. Stop using that excuse. You're worthy because Jesus is worthy. If, if, you're, if you haven't received Jesus Christ and you're like, man, I, I'm motivated by what you're saying, Adam. Well, then believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And don't let anybody stop you from it. Don't be embarrassed. Just believe in your heart and confess out of your own mouth. Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. Help me, Lord. We partake in communion. It's in the back. We do this as a form of worship. We do it to help cleanse our soul, to have a communion with God about doing and remembering what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Of these two elements of the, the, the fruit of the vine represents his blood that was for remission of our sins and the body, his body getting beating, which was for healing of our body. So we do that. So once again, we gather. We have this opportunity now as a group of Christians, a group of people, to praise and worship God. That's what this is about. Don't miss the opportunity. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>